This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Encomium on Helen by Gorgias Written approximately 414 BCE A city is adorned by good citizenship, the body by beauty, the soul by wisdom, acts by virtue, and speech by truthfulness. But the opposite of these virtues are a disgrace. Man and woman, word and deed, city and government, we ought to praise if praiseworthy, and blame if blameworthy. For if it is equally wrong and stupid to censure what is commendable, and to commend what is censurable, now I conceive it to be my duty, in the interest of justice, to refute the slanderers of Helen, the memory of whose misfortunes have been kept alive by the writings of the poets and the fame of her name. I propose, therefore, by argument to exonerate her from the charges of infamy, to convince her accusers of their error, and to remove their ignorance by revelation of the truth. There are few indeed who do not know that by birth Helen ranked among the first men and women of her time. Her mother was the celebrated Leda, her father the god Zeus. Though Tyndareus was reputed to be her father, the former is the mightiest of gods, the latter the noblest of men. Born of such parents, she possessed divine beauty, which she made no attempt to conceal. Nearly all who met her were inspired with love for her, and by her personal charms she attracted many great and haughty suitors. Some of them had abundance of wealth. Others were renowned for their ancient nobility. Some were distinguished for their physical superiority and prowess in war. Others for their mental acquirements but all in common were filled with contentious love and an irresistible spirit of rivalry. Now which of them won Helen, and how he satisfied his love for her, I shall not pretend to say, for to tell people what they already know is a good enough way to gain credence, but not to give pleasure. Passing over, then, that period in my discourse, I shall now address myself to what I have to say, and to set forth the probable cause of Helen's voyage to Troy. Now Helen acted as she did, either by command of the gods and a decree of fate, or she was carried off by force, or yielded to persuasion, or was led captive by love. If, then, her act was the act of the first cause. She certainly ought not to be blamed, for human forethought and prudence can never thwart the will of the gods. In fact, it is a universal law, not that the stronger should yield to the weaker, but the weaker to the stronger, that the stronger should lead and the weaker follow. Now the gods are mightier than men in strength and wisdom, and all things else. Accordingly, we must attribute the fault to fate and the gods, or clear Helen of infamy. But if she was unlawfully carried off by force and shamefully insulted, evidently it was the perpetrator of this outrage who did wrong. She, on the other hand, is to be pitied for the indignity and misfortune she was compelled to suffer. He alone, then, who attempted this barbarous deed deserves to pay the penalty of dishonor and reproach. Well, she ought rather to be pitied than abused for being violently torn from her friends and her native land. Helen was not a sinner, but a sufferer and our feeling for her should not be one of hatred, but of compassion. But if it were the power of speech that moved and beguiled her soul, it will not be difficult to free her of all blame on this score. For the power of speech is mighty. 
insignificant in themselves. Words accomplish the most remarkable ends. They have power to remove fear and assuage pain. Moreover, they can produce joy and increase pity. That this is so, there can be no doubt, as I shall undertake to show. All poetry I call, in accordance with my conception of it, measured speech. Now the readers of poetry are affected in various ways. At times they experience a shivering fear. Then again they feel a tender pity and a mournful longing. In short, every condition of happiness or unhappiness touches a responsive chord in the soul of the reader. Song then, inspired by the gods, produces pleasure and removes pain. For the spirit of song, harmonizing with the sentiment of the soul, soothes and persuades and enchants it. Enchantment differs from magic in that it beguiles the soul, while magic deceives the mind. In this lies the power of song. How many, then, have been persuaded and are still persuaded by the captivating power of speech? Whereas, if we had perfect memory of the past, full knowledge of the present, and a clear foresight of the future, the same language could not so easily present to us the same pictures of the present, past, and future as is now the case. The result would be that in nearly all cases, people would not take counsel of their opinions, for opinions are slippery and insecure and lead those who follow them into a slippery and insecure positions. Since so many have yielded to persuasion, why should we refuse assent to the belief that Helen too was overcome by its irresistible power? And if submission to necessity be a complete defense, why not also submission to persuasion, which is no less powerful than necessity, since it compels assent to what is said and approval of what is done? Paris, I admit, did wrong in exercising upon Helen the compulsory power of persuasion. But in submitting to that power, Helen did nothing to merit condemnation. That persuasion joined with argument can bend the soul to its will. We find illustrated in the discourses of the astronomers, who by overthrowing one theory and setting up another, make the unknown and the incredible appear clear to the mind's eye. Again, we see evidence of this fact in oratorical contest in which a speech delights and persuades a great multitude, owing its effectiveness rather to the force of the rhetorical art than to the power of truth. Finally, the discussions of the philosophers show us how easily the mind may be changed by argument and persuasion. To conclude this part of my argument, then, words have the same effect on the soul that drugs have on the body. For just as different drugs expel different diseases from the body, and some cure sickness and others end life, so words produce various effects on the soul. Some cause pain, and others pleasure. Some terrify, and others encourage while still other drugs enchant the soul with evil persuasion. In yielding to persuasion then, Helen did no wrong, but suffered great misfortune. Let us now consider the case from a fourth point of view. And if we find that Helen acted as she did through love, we must acquit her of all fault. For all things in the visible world are constituted, not as we would have them, but as nature has ordained. And through the sight, this visible world affects the soul in various ways. When, for example, the eye catches sight of hostile bodies in conflict, of assault, and of defense, it is troubled, 
and in turn troubles the soul, so that not infrequently people flee in terror when there is no impending danger. Many a man in the past has lost his presence of mind at some terrible sight. To such an extent does fear paralyze the mind. Many, too, through fear, became dreadfully sick or incurably mad. So powerful an impression does the eye make upon the mind of the things it has seen. To enumerate instances of sight that inspire terror is unnecessary, since in all cases the effect on the soul is the same as in the example I have given. When, however, from many colors and many forms a painter produces one perfect form and figure, he delights our eyes. The sight of beautiful images and statues affords us unspeakable pleasure. So, too, the sight of many things and many persons inspires us with love and longing. Since this is so, what wonder if Helen's eye was captivated by the charms of Paris and transmitted the sensation of love to her soul? And how, if he was a god and possessed of divine power, could she in her weakness repel his advances? But if this be human frailty, we ought not to condemn it as a fault, but regard it as a misfortune. For it comes to us through captivation of the soul, and not by design of the intellect. It results from the necessity of love, and not the premeditation of art. How, then, can we justly censure Helen? For whether she acted through love, persuasion, force, or divine necessity, her conduct is equally defensible. I have now, by argument removed, all stain from Helen's reputation, and accomplished this task I set myself at the beginning, by discrediting unjust censure and ignorant opinion. My purpose has been to make this discourse an encomium of Helen, and a pastime for myself. This ends the Encomium of Helen, written by Gorgias in approximately 414 BCE.